Hello, I'm Ken Hurst, and I'm here with Charles Smith and Daryl Yellen, and we're going to be talking about the golden era of Geelong popular music during the 1960s and 70s, and we're going to try and paint a picture of what the scene was like in those days. And we'll do that by talking about the halls that the bands played in, the pubs, clubs, and uh, the bands themselves and some of the characters that made up that era. So, Charles, tell us about the venues that the bands played in. Well, I think we've got a lot to thank the Christian Church for, Ken, because most of us started off playing in youth club halls and church, church um, socials and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, the main dances were held, of course, at the Palais and uh, at uh, the YMCA Hall in Yarra Street the VRI Hall down in Gordon Avenue, uh, the Croatian Hall in Pagnan Street, the uh, Trades Hall in uh, Meyer Street, and also the, uh, I think it was the Polish ex servicemen's Hall in, uh, in Ryrie Street, just across the road from Dick Connolly's hairdressers, that Centenary figured. Hall, Cario. And the pubs? There were a few mm. pubs, weren't they? Yeah, it didn't play much in the pubs, but my, uh, I think the Eureka was uh, the main one in the city. The Grand yeah. Central, when it existed, oh, that also had bands for a short yeah. time, didn't it? Yes, and Sundowner, of course, later. St Mary's? St Mary's Hall? Didn't know that. <laughs> that, had, that had dance, uh, mostly like the Palais. Can you remember any more pubs? Oh, you? yes. Uh, the, the pubs, that all started in 1966 when the uh, hotel closing went from 6 o'clock until 10 o'clock and then the pubs just uh, took advantage of that and um, they had nearly every pub in Geelong had bands. Uh, from 66 onwards, I would have played in the Bowen Club, the Eureka, the Great Western, the St George Hotel, um, there's a couple of others over in, uh, in Mellop Street, um, which I can't think of the name, Victoria Hotel. The Carlton. The Carlton, yeah, the Carlton had bands too. The Warren Ponds. Um, Warren Ponds Hotel, mm. the Sundowner Hotel. There was just so much work for bands once they opened till 10 o'clock at night, it was unbelievable. It was a pretty, pretty uh, electric scene, wasn't it? It really was, yeah. We were working you know, up to five jobs a week. This is the reason why we're talking to you guys, because you, were, you lived through that period. You were part of that scene, mm. uh, an important part of that scene. You, Daryl, playing guitar and you on uh, bass, Charles, and sometimes guitar, but <laughs> mainly bass. Mainly bass. Um, I was just a kid in the crowd watching you guys play during yeah. that, so that's, this is... Uh, that's where I got my uh, enthusiasm from for the, the scene and for music in general. But maybe we we'll talk about some of the bands. Talk about your band, Daryl, or some of the bands you played in. Uh, well, I started, as Charles said, um, in a little church hall in Sparks Road in Norlane uh, with some other players that didn't go on with it, but um, that would have been in about 1957, 58, thereabouts, and that developed into the Olympics in 1959. Um, and then we went on uh, to actually play here at the Palais. And um, about two or three years after that, one of the other bands that were playing here at the Palais, the Conbez, um, lost their guitar player. And um, he actually went to the Channel 9 Orchestra, David Langdon. And uh, they offered me the job and they were a full-time band, they were professional. So I left the Olympics and played with them for two or three years. Um, and then the, the pub scene sort of started and uh, I left the Converse and the, the Olympics reformed again. And uh, we started to play some pubs and a few jobs in Melbourne at that time and uh, went on with the Olympics for a while and um, that then <laughs> we all swapped and changed so much that uh, developed into a band uh, with uh, Graham Osborne and Wayne McKay. So 
So we, we did the pub circuit in Geelong for probably 10 years like that. Just going back to the Olympics, who were the players in that band? Uh, the Olympics, the first Olympics, the original Olympics, were Ron Cameron on vocal, Brian Rolfe on drums, Barry Lynch on keyboards, uh, Bernie Stahl on bass originally, uh, but he left after a couple of years and then Dennis Parker took over. Bernie Stahl went more into band promotion work. Uh, Bernie Stahl took over, so that, that was the original band. And then when we reformed again with Gavin Grace, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot Bob Johns, he was original too. So it was uh, once Gavin Grace joined, uh, it was then the, the same players plus Gavin. And that was the second edition of the Olympics. And uh, that went on for quite a few years. And Charles, I, I remember watching you in the in-group, mm. an R&B group. Which yeah, the in-group was the first group I played for money in. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that started off as a four-piece with myself on guitar, Roger Fedick on drums, Peter Mills vocal and Steve Lee on bass. And then later on, for some reason or another, this gun drummer called Gordon Pendleton uh, came along and he, I don't know how, but he joined us and Roger went on to rhythm guitar, so we became a five piece. That was a good fun band. We, uh, we uh, played in Geelong and Melbourne uh, and had a lot of fun. You're um, a journeyman as far as the bass goes. You've played in just about every band there is in Geelong. Uh, another reason why we're talking to you now, because you've got so much history about... I've been kicked out of just about every <laughs> band in Geelong. Uh, you know more about the, the era, I think, probably because you've travelled in so many different bands, mm. um, but not as far back as Daryl has. No. So, uh, so I started in 64, uh, I suppose, um, playing with the in-group. Um, and then after that, um, I was, my services were no longer required in the in-group, and I, I joined the, uh, the VIPs with Max Hope, Gary Talbot, and, uh, and Stuart Garrett on, uh, on drums. And they played uh, sort of animals type stuff and uh, uh, getting into soul and blues sort of things. Um, and later on, Bob, jo Bob Johns joined us and uh, we became the Archerbacks Roll Band and uh, played at the Revolver in uh, the Grand Central Hotel and uh, played with them for a few years and then with the Rex Harris group at the Railway Hotel with Rex Harris, Norm Campbellman, great singer Norm and uh, Gordon on drums and uh, myself on bass and uh, that was uh, where I met my wife, actually. <laughs> Rex was on guitar. Rex was playing guitar, yeah. Right. Mm. It's one of the places that you mentioned, the Railway Hotel. These, some of these places don't exist anymore. No, they it's don't. Most unfortunate. No. We um, often used to uh, play at the Railway Hotel till uh, quarter to ten, dismantle our gear, race down to the Eureka Hotel and start playing there at quarter past ten and through till half past eleven. That happened quite a bit, didn't it? Mm. I was in a band that did, did exactly the same mm. thing. Mm. I think it was John Keefe was the promoter. Oh That'd yeah, damn it. Um, and we'd do it half Mods an hour. Mods Tavern. We'd do half the set at Mods Tavern and then go to the Grand Central and play the other half there. Yeah. And that band there would swap over halfway yeah. through. With all our equipment, it wasn't, there was no walk-ups. We had to bring all the equipment and yeah, create everything right. yourself. Mm. Um, but that was the way it was, wasn't it? In those yeah. days. Mm. Everywhere you went, there seemed to be a band playing. Uh, and all sorts of bands too. Mm -hmm. The Olympics, what sort of music was Olympics playing? Um, the Olympics were playing whatever was on the charts at the time. We pretty much started off playing Shadows music. That's how the band started. But then um, vocally, we'd be doing whatever was in the top 40 at the time. That's what we tried to do anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, the vocal songs were all that type of thing. Whatever was around in the 
that was between 60 and say 66, the type of music that were, was on the charts was what we tried to play. Right. Every time a new one came out, we'd, be, we'd jump right onto it and we'd have the chords worked out and we'd be doing it the next week. We tried to. I can remember you doing very good versions of uh, Sounds Incorporated material. Sounds Incorporated, we did, and, and they were big at the time, weren't they? They That's toured right. Australia with the Beatles. Yeah, with Bobby Johns. Covered that stuff very well, actually, on sax. Mm. This is always a problem when we talk about other musicians and other bands. We wouldn't be going out, we'd be playing somewhere and there'd be every other band in Geelong playing somewhere else. Yeah, that's and true. we didn't get to, to see the other bands playing. We'd hear of what they were doing, but we didn't ever have a chance to see them, unfortunately. Well, maybe, I can fill in some gaps on that later, but maybe describe a night, particular, like a normal night in Geelong, playing in you know, one of your, your standard haunts. Mm. What, would that, what would that entail? It would depend if you're talking uh, early 60s, it would be here at the Palais, and normally there'd be two bands playing at the Palais. Um, in my time, it would be the Olympics alongside either the Five Nights or the Convairs here on stage, um, and we'd be playing at that time dance music. So we had to pick songs that were either a Foxtrot or a Pride of Erin or a Modern Waltz or whatever it is. Ballroom dancing. Um, ballroom dancing, pretty much, mm -hmm. in that era. Um, so th the night would be um, listening to the other band when you're not playing and then playing the other half of the night, basically. Yeah. Um, when I was here, I was only, the Olympics, I was only 15. And my father would be sitting upstairs in one of those seats because he had to drive me here and take wow. me home afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, that was my night. I, I didn't really do much after the job because Dad was waiting to drive me home. In the car, yeah. Um, for you, I don't know, you, you, you came along a little bit later than that, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, a bit later. We were generally playing the whole night ourselves, mm. not with another band. Um, and like Daryl says, um, we were playing quite a lot. Didn't get a chance to see other bands or um, only if, say, we were playing at Surf City um, and we, could, we had half the night or a bit more off because we could then watch the Deacons and, and we could sort of see the crowd and that sort of thing. And it was absolute chaos up there at uh, Surf City. <laughs> it was, wasn't it? It was. <laughs> well, maybe I can fill in some gaps here because I was, I was a punter then, I wasn't a mm. musician at all. And I'd go out from about 65 or 66, I'd go out and, and watch all the bands. Usually Mod 7 would be my right. favourite place to go. And that's where all the, you'd have the, the touring bands down from Melbourne, all international groups, you know, like the Twilights and the Easy Beats, all those, the big bands would mm. come and play there. Mm. Um, but I saw the VIPs there. I saw um, a lot of different bands in there. Um, Silver Clouds. The Silver Clouds. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure the Nas played there once. Yes, they did. And we might go through a list a little later on and uh, explain who played in those, some of those bands. Mm. I remember seeing Johnny Young and company down there <laughs> playing with them one night. The, um, the Palais, I remember coming to the Palais. Uh, there's hardly anybody in Geelong who didn't come here at one stage. Yeah. And we've mentioned that we're sitting here in the Palais and it, it is. It's, it's uh, it's Geelong's musical centre, isn't it? It's the yeah. heart of Geelong. It is. Yeah. And it's uh, yeah. become a, a new entertainment centre again now uh, as, this, as the renovations take shape. Mm. Mm. So uh, it's going to be a great future for Geelong. And, mm. and well, the, uh, certainly in the early days, this was the main place for music in Geelong. Yeah. And everybody aspired to play at the Palais, mm. basically. Yeah. Um, and before I got to play here, I used to come here and watch with my mouth open as well and watch some of the pioneers here playing, you know, we're talking, my idol was Gordon Gillum, guitar player um, in the late 50s. I used to come here just to see him play every week. And he also played down at the Gresham, 
most of the bands that played here played at the Gresham as well, which is the YMCA you referred mm. to. And um, I'd be there every week too. I think that was Wednesday or Thursday night. And I'd, I'd listen to them. Um, little did I know within two or three years I'd be playing with those people. But they were all five or six years older than me, but I'd listen to Max Hope and Gavin Cunningham. Um, you know, they were, they were all great musicians. Normie Campbellman, great singer as well from those early days. And um, they're really the pioneers of modern music in Geelong, those people. And they're, they're all either not with us or they're in their 80s now, those people. Mm. All those this is musicians. Where, the Palais was where I had all my music lessons because we couldn't afford lessons in those days. We <laughs> couldn't hardly afford instruments. <laughs> And I, I, I had all my lessons watching Mick Evans and Daryl Yellen playing guitar. Uh, <laughs> even though yeah. I'm the same age as Daryl, I was quite a bit behind him on the, on the music stakes. Yeah, I think yes, that's, that's the Palais how... certainly played a big part in most of our lives, I it think. It did. Mm. Either, either as, as a painter or as a dancer or you know, somewhere to come and meet a woman or, or playing here, or both. Mm. Mm. Um, right. And then, then there was the support, the Geelong support bands, as I call them, the unsung heroes of Geelong music scene who, who did the supports for the touring acts mm. and sometimes backed them as well. Yeah, that's right. And without them, there wouldn't have been acts. So no. um, and a lot of important bands, a lot of them play right here, like the Wanderers and the Five Nights, yep. um, myself, um, the Levi's, uh, really important bands to Geelong. Mm. Mm. Unicords. Unicords, yeah, yeah it's mm. not well, Some of those early bands were the Sleepy Hollow Three, very early bands we're talking now. The Electones yep. would have been right back then. Um, the Five Nights were pretty early, uh, and the Convairs, uh, they were pretty much all of the early ones. Uh, Will and the Wreckers was the other band that they were was, the big stars. Was very yeah, that's right. They were. They, <laughs> they were the trendsetters. Uh, that's for sure. Um, Normie Campbellman sang with them. Tony Blake played bass, and he had a Framus bass that was made to be a stand-up, like a double bass. But he used to string it around his neck, swapping <laughs> the Framus bass, and stand just over there. Mm. I can remember him well. And uh, Willen and the Wreckers were a very good band for the time, you know, they were right with it. And uh, they didn't seem to last long. The, the members of that band dispersed into other yeah, groups. They did. Mm. Mm -hmm. but I, I remember the, the bands, um, the touring bands, you know, the big name groups. But uh, the scene in Geelong was such that you could go from one place to another throughout the night and you might pick up five or six or seven different bands, mm. some mm. from just starting out, you know, local guys just starting out to the very top bands. Mm. Um, and it was so easy to get work as a musician because <laughs> was <it> everything <laughs> was open. Was, yeah. you know, anybody who wanted to get a crowd to their establishment had to have a band. Mm. That's right, yeah. yeah. That's why there was so much work around. Mm. Teen Beats is another band that... Uh, that I didn't mention, but they were one of the early pioneer bands with Peter Thornton, Peter Snags Thornton. That's him. Um, the lead vocalist. Uh, and uh, they were, uh, well, as the name suggests, all teenagers, but uh, a very good band at the time as well. Hmm. Peter, Peter went on to found the Levi's. He did, that's yeah, right, yes, yeah. Pretty much. And then there was the Continental bands mm. that, mm. that, that were tucked away in the Polish clubs and the you know, the, the Dutch clubs, the Italian clubs. Yeah. Italian clubs. yeah. Mm. Uh, though they had their scene to themselves as well mm. for quite a long mm. time. Definitely. So that was also going on. So it must have been, how many bands do you think would have been playing at one, on any one night, on any one Saturday night? Ooh. That'd be 20 or 30, wouldn't it? Oh, at least. Did it have to at be? At least 20. Yeah. yeah. If you're talking uh, after 1966 when the hotels all went late, then there'd have to be 20 bands playing in, in Geelong on any Saturday night anyway, yeah. that's for sure. And, and that's without the private work, because <clears throat> we all did 
weddings and cabarets and that sort of work. And as something well. you don't yes. see anymore. You don't. No. Balls. 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 Yeah. yeah. Winter balls, time. Yeah. Except the deputy on balls. Deb, occasionally. Deb balls are still going. Yeah. I think Just about the, every every mm. organisation, every big workplace, every big school had a ball. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yes. I, I, when I played in Levi's, you've, you've played cabaret too. Mm. Um, mm. We, we were playing every Friday, every Saturday night at a cabaret. Yeah, that's right. Almost non That's what it was like. Yeah. Yep. Um, constant. And they were great nights too. But for the players, you know, you, you can probably look through this list of bands and you'll see the same name in two or three of them because people moved around quite a bit yeah. during that period. I don't think that's changed. Um, I don't think we've, you know, we've mentioned most of the top vocalists at the time were Gavin Cunningham, Max Hope, um, Normie Campbellman were the biggest of them, Ron Cameron, who was with the Olympics but eventually went to America. Never heard of him again, I'm not sure whether he continued with his singing career. Uh, and Peter Thornton we mentioned. Uh, they were most of the, the big name vocalists of the time. Gavin Grace. Who was Gavin Grace, who came along in the mid 60s, hmm. uh, was one of the best in Dor. Yeah, he had a great voice. A great voice, yeah. Good, good player. But, but then, you know, you, 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 can you go through all of the drummers that played in Geelong or all of the guitar players or all of the bass players? There's so many. Yeah, there are. You know? Well, a friend of ours, Sam Sanders-Spiro, he's organised a list of all the bands as, and, and all the players in them uh, as best he could. And I think there's about 500 players just from that's that right. period. That's right. And about 300 bands. 300 bands, yeah. Mm. <laughs> that, just looking at those two <laughs> numbers together tells you that some have played in the same bands that's over right. and over. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, some of the standouts for me, I think, were the, the sax players, um, Bob Johns and Graham Osborne were both very good in, the, in that era mm -hmm. uh, as, as modern sax players. There are other ones. Uh, Kevin Harrington, Harrington, Harrington <clears throat> was a more mellow sax player, but he was a dance band sax player, really. Not so much in modern times. Drummers, the best of the drummers, well, You've got Gordon Pendleton, Wayne McKay, uh, Colin Mayle, who was one of the early drummers in a couple of the early bands, uh, Billy Cancross. Not anymore? Um, uh, well, there was... Um, you mentioned Wayne, didn't you? Yeah, Wayne. Brian Rolfe. Brian Rolfe, yeah, definitely Brian very Rolfe. Good. Was very good in from the very early days, yeah. Yeah. Um, so then, bass players, you, you can reel those off. Yeah, well, I really, um, I really admired Tony Blake's playing. Yeah, so did I. Um, I, I didn't see many bass players. Um, no one's listens to bass players, no. do they, Charles? It's, no. <laughs> it's strange, though, in the early days, a bass in a band wasn't a necessity. No. Um, a few of the bands didn't have a bass player at all. Mm. The Five Nights started without a bass they player. They did, that's right, yeah. So the bass came along a little bit later. Guitar players, well, there was Mick Evans, who is definitely worth a mention, and a pioneer, played here, played from the late 50s. Um, I mentioned Neil Abbott. Um, we can't place him in a band, but I know he was playing around town at the time. Dennis, uh, Dennis Ingalls. Dennis Ingalls. was very good. Who was, um, I grew up with. He was a neighbour of mine, and we learned guitar together out of the Coles number one <laughs> chord book. Um, I learned out of the Nick Maniloff book. Oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so Dennis, uh, definitely worth a mention. Um, who else have we got? Con Keats was playing. You were getting into the sixties. There was Jeff Asher. He was very Jeff good Asher, guitar player yeah. because there was the pre Beatles and the after Beatles. Uh, the pre Beatles was very much the the dance bandy sort of thing, 
uh, with the, all the American soppy Bobby V type music. <laughs> and, and after the Beatles, there was a, a proliferation of bands. Um, just about everybody played in the band. Yeah. And, mm. and the, the, um, the migrant community uh, contributed enormously to that because the, the number of bands that came out of the migrant hostel at, uh, at Noor Lane was incredible. Mm. And, and the Musos, you know, we're talking about Gordon Pendleton before. Yeah, that's and, right. And, that and was Les another Berg venue. And, mm. and, um, and Peter Mills, the singer in the in-group, and Roger Fedick, uh, he, he was Polish. He, <laughs> you know, people from all nationalities mixed together. It was a real multicultural scene. They did. And, and in that, um, that post-Beatles era, uh, we had the in-group that we were talking about before, the, um, the Silver Clouds and the VIPs, but also the Howling Wolves, they were, they were all from Norlane. Um, uh, the Gnomes of Abelia, uh, quite a few of them were migrants as well. The Bomboras, the Huntsmen, uh, the boys, the victims, they were a great young band. They, they, uh, they won the Battle of the Sounds at least once. Oh, the Syndicate, mm -hmm. um, the Rhythms Incorporated, and, and another band called the Spectres, who were a very early uh, Shadows tribute band. They, they had the sound of the Shadows down pat. And I forgot to mention one of my favorite bands a trio called the Biggles Brothers. The Biggles Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Who we, we, use, we, we got our start at the Argyle Hotel. Who was the lineup then? The lineup was Donnie McLeod on drums, Ron Edmonds, Ron Edmonds. and myself on bass. And another band that uh, stood out in that post Beatles era was uh, Jerry's band. Yeah. They, were, they were terrific. I was lucky enough to be at school with Jerry and uh, Marty Oswald, yeah. uh, Alan James, Rod Bell, all those guys who were emerging in the late 60s. Mm. Um, some a bit earlier, but yeah. mostly around about the mid 60s. And they were emerging from the schools like, like a lot of kids were in those days. They were coming mm. out of schools in the East and in Belmont and out mm. in Lane and forming their groups from those areas, you know, geographically linked to those areas. Um, and Jerry was one of those, a great great singer, Jerry. Mm. And uh, then there's Daryl Moody, played bass. That's right. He was good. And um, John Ferguson joined on lead guitar. Rob Bell on drums. Uh, it was a great time, for me anyway, for that, that period of time where I started to get out and playing in groups. The very first year I played, and I'm not saying this as a, a big note in myself, I'm saying it to show um, what opportunities we had back mm -hmm. then, mm. Uh, such was, I started playing bass in January of 69 and by June of that year, the band had played um, alongside people like Doug Parkinson, Max Merritt, we'd backed Russell Morris, um, Marcia Jones and the Cookies, mm. and, and come second in Battle of the Sounds. That's in the first six months. <laughs> Incredible, isn't that's, it? Yeah. That's how the scene was then. Yeah. There was just so much going on. You that's had right. so much opportunity to do and work with all those people. Yeah. That's right. Um, it was just a great time. 